So team, buenas tardes and good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our Respect Ability Charla. This is a part of HHF's year-long partnership with AARP to impact our community through salud, dinero, y mucho, mucho amor. And so today, team, we will highlight and give space to a section of our comunidad that is underrepresented and underserved. This charla will give a platform to people living with disabilities that are seen and unseen, and the space to share their personal stories, as well as those who have acted in caregiving roles to share their experiences, and as always, a place for resources that better serve our community to be shared here in this beautiful space. So for those tuning in who would prefer the option to follow along in Espanol or ASL, please take the time now to adjust the settings at the bottom of your screen. So you'll see if you scroll down to your Zoom, you'll have all of the options down there to be able to toggle that either on or off. On another logistical note, please use the chat box to ask questions, raise concerns, or just give us straight up energy. And if you like what you're hearing, let us know. And then also just ensure that it's also set to all audience and not to the default of panelists because we want everyone to see your comments and questions. So when you go into the chat box team, make sure that you select that drop down section to everyone, because when you put into the chat, it might just only be going to the hosts and panelists. We want everyone to be able to see your comments and questions. Now we will try to answer all of your questions either at the end of the program, via in the chat box, and also in a follow-up email that will also include all of the wonderful resources that are shared here today. So team, that's the logistical end. Enough with me, I just wanna get started now. So I'm very, very excited to announce and introduce the first speaker for today. And I'd like all of us uh, to give a virtual round of applause and welcome to Yvette Peña, the Vice President of Audience Strategy at the Office of Diversity and Equity Inclusion from AARP. Hola, I'm Yvette Peña. Gracias for joining this charla hosted by the Hispanic Heritage Foundation. It is sponsored by AARP and focuses on respectability and how juntos we are to ensure that the door to opportunity remains open for people with disabilities and deaf adults. I hope you're as excited as I am to hear from speakers and to listen to their stories. My role in the Office of Diversity, Equity and Inclusion at AARP as Vice President of Audience Strategy is leading the Latino audience strategy nationwide. And now it also includes working to lead AARP's commitment to people living with disabilities, as well as AARP's work with deaf adults. I welcome this opportunity as it allows me to look for intersections. For example, one in six Hispanic Latinos are people with disabilities and nearly one in seven Hispanic Latino adults are impacted by hearing loss. It's crucial for leaders and advocates to take part in cross-cultural conversations like today's charla. After all, advocacy starts with empatia. We must listen in order to make a difference and then take action. At AARP, our social mission, what we do for one, we do for all, serves as a catalyst for all that we do. It informs ARP's commitment to collecting data and conducting in-depth research to ensure that we better understand everyone living in communities we serve. I learn something new every day about someone or about a community. For people with disabilities, a February AARP story covered the fact that more workers with disabilities found jobs in 2022. That's an important development, but work still remains. For example, the same story found that many workers with disabilities are older adults. According to the Bureau of Labor Standards data, the 32.6 million people with disabilities in the US 16 million were 65 and older, followed by 10 million over the age of 45. Because many workers with disabilities are also older adults, they can encounter discrimination based on both age and ability in the workplace. At AARP, we know that disability is not inability. 
We advocate for equal opportunity for all and champion inclusivity through our caregiving guides and many other tools that we create to help multi-generational families live life on their own terms. I invite you to visit aarp.org or aarp.org forward slash Espanol. Before I close, I want to thank the Hispanic Heritage Foundation and Tony Tijerino for creating this space where people can express their experiences, share their resources, address stigmas, and advocate for lives filled with more salud, dinero, y amor for all. Systematic change starts with these conversations, and you are already making a difference by being here in this safe space. Gracias, and let the charla begin. Gracias, Yvette. Y muchas gracias for being here, and thank you to AARP. Um, up next, I'd like to, to introduce uh, Mr. Ray Casas, who is calling in from Fort Worth, Texas, who is the Director of Community Impact at the Texas Rangers Baseball Club. Ray, thank you so much for being here. The mic is yours, boss. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, I just, first of all, want to thank Yvette and AARP and the Hispanic Heritage Foundation for hosting this uh, important discussion. Um, I was blessed a long time ago to uh, be come into this world and having uh, a sister that uh, was born with cerebral palsy. And um, I never really knew she was physically different uh, until we went to elementary school. And even though I'm the bigger brother and I uh, we're, we're 14 months apart, <clears throat> uh, she you know, she wasn't supposed to live past the age of two. Uh, and she just really defied the odds. And this was back in the 70s when uh, there really wasn't a lot of uh, treatment for, for those that were born with CP or cerebral palsy. And for those of you that don't know, cerebral palsy affects uh, your motor skills. And unfortunately she was born with her umbilical cord wrapped around her neck. So it cut off the oxygen to her brain. And, um, you know, I think for for years, sort of going through elementary school, um, you know, I just saw all the perseverance that she lived with, and and she never let anyone tell her she couldn't do anything. But I think I learned a lot about patience, and it was probably the first time when I was younger that I learned about empathy, because as an able-bodied person, uh, I was able to do all the things that I wanted to do. I got to play sports. I got to play baseball in high school and in college um, while she had about 26 surgeries in her life. Um, but, you know, that never that never kept her from achieving her goals. Uh, she uh, graduated with a master's degree in, in uh, counseling. Um, she is my hero. Uh, she is somebody that um, you never want to sell herself short in, in her abilities. Uh, she's just been an amazing person. She's really been the rock of our family. Even when I moved away to DC and I, I got to work for Tony and, um, you know, moved around quite a bit. Um, and, you know, in 2018, I had just started my own PR company in Los Angeles. And, um, and ultimately, you know, I ended up coming back to Texas because my stepdad was diagnosed with a a rare blood cancer. So not only did I grow up with a sister that was born with a disability, a physical disability, but then I became a caregiver to my stepdad who um, was fighting in the biggest battle of his life. And, you know, I think one of the things that I learned in coming back home was I had learned all those things from being a big brother to my sister but I also learned about the importance of self-wellness and self-care because I think I had thrown myself into taking care of my stepdad, taking care of my sister, and then my mother, who was also trying to be a caregiver to my stepdad. So all of those things, I think, you know, listening was a really huge thing that I had to really focus on, on, on kind of finding out what those needs were as a caregiver. But also, you know, I... You know, I took care of my stepdad for, you know, about a year and a half, two years um, until he passed away. But, you know, 
it brought our family closer together. And, and all I can say, I think, in what I've learned so far is that it's very easy to lose yourself in being a caregiver and being somebody that can help others that are dealing with or disabilities. So it's really important to take care of yourself, but also make sure that you are just doing the best that you can, you know, to, to take care of yourself. So um, I'll kind of stop right there because I could keep going on, on and on about about my sister and my my stepdad. But it's been a blessing to be able to serve, and I think um, you know I've been blessed with other things uh, that have allowed me to do those things. So just want to say thank you for the time, and I, I turn it back over. Ray, thank thank you so much, brother, and thank you for sharing that incredibly powerful story and personal story of your sister, your translation then after that into becoming a caretaker and, and really important piece team, as, as he mentioned, is that self-care uh, aspect of, uh, of the work. And, and we have to be able to take care of ourselves in order to continue to pour into others team. So Ray, thank you so much. Thank you for what you do, brother. And thank you for, uh, for being committed to your family and community, brother. Thank you. Uh, team up next, uh, we have Miss Lisa Lorraine from Montgomery County, Maryland and is the Breaking Barriers Manager at Jubilee. Lisa, welcome. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much. Um, as the Breaking Barriers Manager at Jubilee Association of Maryland, I work with a coalition of partners, government agencies, and advocates who believe that the Hispanic community should have increased access to support services for people with intellectual and developmental disabilities. And as the Hispanic Heritage Foundation works to inspire and develop Latino leaders, it's critical that we educate those future leaders on the realities of the systemic barriers that exist for those that are most vulnerable in our community. According to the most recent census data, 10% of Hispanics in the United States have a disability. That's 6.2 million people. And like Ray mentioned, caring for family members with disabilities is often a difficult and can be a full-time job for a child, a parent, a grandparent, or a sibling. I believe that Hispanic caregivers often go it alone because they are family-oriented, resilient, and responsible, but it can be a lonely and stressful sacrifice for the caregiver. But family members do not need to shoulder caregiving responsibilities alone. In fact, when caregivers access available support services, they give both themselves and the person they're caring for the opportunity to live an even more meaningful life. Because when you are going it alone, you're operating in survival mode. But when you access support, you can think more clearly about the vision that you want for your own life and the life of the person with the disability. And the support is there to help you make that happen. We know that there is a huge equity gap and people with disabilities of Hispanic descent are not accessing the caregiving and supports needed to live a meaningful life at the same rates as non-Hispanic whites. In Montgomery County, Maryland, where I work, Hispanics make up 20% of the county population, yet only 7% of the people receiving services from the Maryland Developmental Disabilities Administration are Hispanic. When we zoom out to nationwide data, the disparities remain stark. 25% of Hispanics with a disability live in poverty compared to 18% of non-Hispanic white people with a disability that live in poverty. And 89% of Hispanics with a disability have insurance coverage compared to 96% of non-Hispanic white people with disabilities. We have to ask ourselves why our Hispanic community and other traditionally underserved communities are not accessing available services. For many families, the barriers to care are too high a hill to climb. We have found that language is a primary barrier to getting care. Even for native English speakers, the government provided information can be confusing and hard to understand. Add in a language barrier and it's often impossible to understand the steps required to even apply, let alone get the needed services. I'd like to share with you how breaking down barriers like language can result in positive outcomes for families. 
I helped the family of a 22-year-old Latina with Down syndrome make their first appointment to apply for Social Security benefits, a benefit the young woman has been eligible for since age 18, but the family did not know that she could apply for it. I called the office of a neurologist that is a Medicaid provider to advocate for a family who was told they needed to bring their own Spanish interpreter to the appointment, even though the medical office must provide an interpreter by law. And with another family I worked with, I was able to help with a communication misunderstanding that happened when the service coordinator was communicating with mom in English, even though mom's primary language is Spanish. That mishap almost led to the family missing a priority window of time during which they could access support services for supporting their adult autistic child after he graduated from high school. If they hadn't accessed the services during that priority window, he would have had to wait until he was in a time of crisis before being able to access those same services. I find that families need a lot of one-on-one -on -one guidance in their primary language, and when given that guidance, they are willing and able to access support services. We have created resources to help people in Spanish and other languages. These resources are available and free to all on the Jubilee Association of Maryland website. We also lead a group of 25 disability organizations in Maryland called Enrique Siendo Vidas. The Enrique Siendo Vidas network gets information to the disability community in Spanish through Facebook and WhatsApp. You can find us by searching Facebook for Enrique Siendo Vidas USA. We still have a long way to go before there is an equitable and accessible system for Hispanic people with disabilities. The general public must hold agencies and organizations accountable for their language translation and interpretation responsibilities under law, as well as for collecting and analyzing demographic data to ensure that they are serving everyone equitably. Please help us get the word out about the systemic changes that are needed. And feel free to contact me if you'd like to be a part of our advocacy efforts. Thank you. Lisa, thank you so much. You do have a couple of questions in the chat box um, that, that I'll, I'll send over to you in the meantime. But Lisa, thank you so much for the work that you do uh, there in Maryland and for bringing these wonderful um, and eye-opening statistics that I was not aware about. So thank you so much for, for bringing that and sharing your personal experience and what you're doing with that coalition um, to help these communities navigate these systems. I mean, that's so critical. So Lisa, thank you so much. Um, it looks like from the chat box, you have a lot of allies um, that wanna assist in scaling your efforts. So Lisa, thank you so, so much. Uh, team up next, now we will hear from Miguel Lugo from Whittier, California, who's the Assistant Director of Outreach and Leadership Training for Disability Voices United and the Program Manager for Integrated Community Collaborative. Miguel, thank you so much for being here, boss. Take it away, brother. Thank you so much, Hector. Buenas tardes. I want to thank all of you for having me. Lisa, your, pre your presentation was awesome. And Ray, heads up to you and your sister. Your sister is doing it, which, which is what I love to hear. Um. So, my name is Miguel Echoico Lugo, and a lot of people ask me why Echoico, but that's a conversation for a whole other day. People see me in my electric wheelchair struggling to control my uncontrollable limbs and assume that my phys physical disability is the biggest barrier in my life when in fact the biggest barrier that i have faced in my life is actually my alcoholism i will share that today i am 130 days sober uh which is hasn't been easy hasn't been easy but it's definitely possible 
I was diagnosed with cerebral palsy at the age of four, and I was enrolled into the regional center system. I went on to be a part of a special education system, which led me to getting bused about 10 miles to a school when there was four schools in my city of Montebello. But those schools did not, didn't have a special ed program. Due to the language barrier, my mom had a very difficult time advocating for my needs. As we all know, the Mexican culture is a culture of hard workers, and that was something that was definitely instilled in me. I saw them, I saw the way that my parents never gave up and always fought for their goal of owning a home in the United States, the American dream. <clears throat> At the beginning of my eighth grade, I learned that the high school that I was going to that I was going to go to was eight miles away from, from my home. This was when I told when I told my parents that I didn't want to go to that school and that I wanted to stay in my home home city. Little did I know that that was called advocating. Even the school administrators and staff said that I would not handle the workload. I went on to graduate six months ahead of time. I went on to attend Cerritos Community College, but not having the proper support didn't give me the opportunity that I should have had to complete my college career. It would take me longer to turn a page than to actually read it. That was one thing that I found most discouraging. I went on to become a, a job developer for disabled adults, and that's when I discovered my talent of comedy. I would get in trouble all day for cracking jokes at, in the office. I was called into the office, and a buddy of mine offered to take me to an open mic. I went to an open mic 10 years ago, and ever since then, I have traveled, I have had the opportunity to get to know places that I've never even dreamt of. Uh, back in December 31st of 2019, I was hit with a series of three strokes. Um, I have recovered since then. I am married. I have a stepchild and I'm pushing forward. I am not letting anything hold me back. If anything, I am going stronger. I think we all can. Um, I do want to share, I do have a documentary that will be coming out this fall. The documentary is called Mi Viva Chueca. And I do produce my own comedy show the first Saturday of every month at a place in San Pedro, California called the Artistry Gallery and Lounge. I said, if anyone would wants to stop by, you're more than welcome to. And I can keep on going forever, but I think that's my time. 
Miguel, thank you so much. I almost wanted to tempt you to share a joke with us. Uh, but, but Miguel, thank you so much for sharing this incredibly powerful story of perseverance and of your personal life. Um, thank you so much. And then I hope you're you, when you get an opportunity to go into the chat box and, and see uh, and feel the love um, and the inspiration that you are, Miguel. So, so thank you so much for being here, sharing your story and never allowing anyone to dictate the outcomes for your life and you doing it for yourself. Miguel, thank you so much. And thank you for being here. Thank you. Thank you. Team, now we will hear from Lizette Uria from Fairfax, Virginia, who is the Latino Outreach Specialist at Parent Educational Advocacy Training Center. Lizette, please take it away. Hi, good afternoon, everybody, and thank you so much to the Hispanic Heritage Foundation and AARP for having me here. It's truly a very important topic that we should all be uh, discussing and creating more awareness, but I'm glad to be here. And yes, my name is Lizette Uriah. I'm the uh, Latina Ori Specialist for Pizzi. For those who may not be aware of uh, who Pizzi is, we are a nonprofit in the state of Virginia. So we serve the entire state of Virginia. We've been doing so uh, for over 40 years. Um, and really, it's a statewide nonprofit. Our passion is to empower families of children with disabilities in the state of Virginia, and we serve uh, as the uh, parent training center of the state of Virginia. So we, uh, our central focus is really to be able to empower families who are currently navigating the special education system and disability services systems. Uh, we have different areas that allow us to communicate and to target different communities, um, and one of them is our Latino outreach. Uh, we understand that it's very important for us to be able to empower, inform, educate families, not only our Latino community, but really, um, you know, all families who are currently navigating the special education system um, and empower them with more information and education. And so the mission of uh, PT really is to be able to uh, provide them with all this knowledge that they need so that they can become better advocates for their children. And that's one of the main things that our families truly need. Not only are we breaking barriers by providing them with information in a language that they understand, but at the same time, we are um, making it more accessible for them to understand um, their rights as parents of, ch of a child with a disability so that they can empower their children and so that they can go off to uh, have a more independent uh, life after they graduate from high school, right? So we're talking about all the, uh, all the processes that come with special education, when we're speaking about education in general, uh, making sure that families are aware about their rights, making sure that families are understanding uh, the terminology and the vocabulary that comes with special education, which as Lisa already mentioned, uh, when you come into a new country and you're already uh, having to deal with um, you know, understanding and learning a new language. And now you have been informed that your child may have a disability. Um, so now you have to understand not only how the education system works in the U.S., but also understand your rights as a parent of a, of a child with a disability, understand the vocabulary, understand the terminology, and understand really how this process works. So really being able to empower our families to be a part of the table, to understand that they have rights, um, and that they can advocate for their child. And again, being able to pass those same skills to their children so that they can become better advocates for themselves as well. So those, that's really the mission that uh, PT provides here uh, through Virginia. Uh, but for families who may be outside of Virginia, who are maybe in Maryland or uh, live in California, you know, understand that uh, under IDEA or IDEA, which is the federal law that protects the rights of individuals with disabilities, uh, PTIs or the parent training centers, uh, uh, information centers are um, are part of the law. So they're mandated in every state. So if they cannot communicate with PTC and they're looking for information on how to better understand and navigate the, the special education system, they can also contact their uh, PTI in their own state. If they're living in Virginia, but they're moving to a different state, they can do the same. And so we are here to connect with families and educate them and inform them, inform them and help them navigate the special education system. Um, part of uh, my mission is to really be able to connect with families all, all across Virginia um, and really all across the, the U.S. so that we can continue promoting more education and empowerment. So again, that they feel a part of the table and not uh, discriminated against or uh, feel intimidated because of all, all the uh, processes and all the uh, terminology that can be, uh, you know, so complex for so many families. 
Um, so we, with, through our mission, we're able to provide them with different workshops, uh, trainings, conferences, everything that they need so they can better prepare themselves and also provide them with individual um, calls um, if they have any questions regarding their, their child's education uh, if they're already in the system. So this is a really great way to empower families again to be a part of the child's education uh, let them know that it's important for them to be a part of the table, understand more about their rights, and how that can also create a difference in their child's education as they uh, continue through the different grades. And so PT is here. If anyone has any questions, we'll, we'll be happy to answer more. Uh, we are constantly providing, again, different trainings and opportunities for families to learn and empower themselves, not only in English, but also in Spanish. We have programs uh, not only for our Latino community, but also uh, military outreach, our early childhood engagement uh, program, uh, family engagement. All these programs are really are so important for us to be able to empower families um, and provide them with information that they're looking for um, and fill those holes and really be able to uh, break those barriers and uh, fill those gaps that um, you know are constantly becoming barriers for families. Lisette, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, it, it, it's looking like, and also me personally, we'll be reaching out to you um, to talk about some of these beautiful services. And team, as, as Lisa um, brought the idea to the table and as Lisette expanded on it, we know and the research shows that when the providers speak our language and our community language, it leads to better health outcomes. So, so thank you, Lisette and Lisa, for that, for that work. And we hope that we can scale it um, throughout the country, as, as, as you mentioned. Um, and just thank you so much for being an advocate for our comunidad, for our families. And then most importantly, uh, not just giving them the fish, but teaching them how to fish and how to be advocates for themselves and understand the systems um, which and where they live. So thank you. Thank you so much, Lisa. Um, and, and when you get an opportunity, uh, you're getting a lot of love in the, in the chat box as well. So thank you so much for being here. Uh, team, up next, uh, we have... Uh, Coming to us from Washington, D.C., we have Dr. Laura Rubalcaba, who is a doctor uh, of psychology uh, on the East Coast. So, uh, Dr. Rubalcaba, thank you so much for being here. Hi, um, <clears throat> you're welcome. Um, let's see where we'll get started. Um, I'll go to the next slide, please. So today I'm going to be um, really trying to make this as personal as possible. Um, <laughs> I am going to start off by defining what a learning disability is, and I'm going to share a little bit of my learned experience, lived experience of having um, two learning disabilities, but particularly focusing on the one that affects me most. Um, the next topic, how I succeeded despite having these learning difficulties. And lastly, I'm going to throw in some useful data on the importance of caregivers to those who do have learning disabilities in the Latino community. Uh, next slide, please. So learning disability is defined simply by, are there disorders that affect the ability to understand or use spoken or written language, do mathematical calculations, coordinate movements, according to the dictionary, the Oxford Dictionary. Next. Next slide. Okay. So here I put in a bunch of pictures of myself um, graduating through the years. Um, my story. So I went to Catholic school my entire life through college, uh, undergrad. And in doing so, um, I had two learning disabilities that were overlooked. Um, and when you go to Catholic school, they don't have school psychologists um, on staff. And uh, usually the school counselor there focuses more on getting you in, like in high school, focuses, focuses more on you getting into college and, you know, looking for scholarships. And so um, I kind of slipped through the cracks. Um, if I would have gone to a public school, then I, my learning disabilities would have been identified and um, I could have received help sooner than later. Um, I put number two, I've always been like a teacher's pet, but I did kind of have some feedback in high school about behavior, like being impulsive and also hyperactive. 
And in 2005, I was diagnosed with ADHD, which I know a lot of people uh, have, but there's also a lot of misconceptions about it. Um, and uh, following that diagnosis, I decided to become an expert on how to study. I remember the moment I Googled the best ways to study, best ways to take notes. And these are some of the things I did to get started in learning about the impact of the, the ADHD had on me and in my, in my various environments. Uh, lastly, uh, when I was in my doctoral program, second year um, in 2014, I was uh, taken to the side by one of my professors at the end of class. And she asked me, have you ever heard of auditory processing disorder? Because apparently in class, I was holding one ear like this while people were talking because everybody had an, like a lot of people were from all over the country and in, uh, in Washington, DC and the people in my class, they had accents. And I had no idea that I was even trying to like uh, purposefully not listen to them because the accent was irritating my 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 auditory system. Next. I'm Next. sorry, I know that you use real words just now, but to me it sounded like literal gibberish, so I caught none of it. There are people talking across the room and my brain has latched onto their conversation and can't filter them out enough to understand you. I heard every word you said and it's on repeat in my brain so that I can actually process what they mean. It might take a moment. Sorry, I completely left my body for a minute there. What did you say? Don't get me wrong, I really appreciate you wearing your mask for safety. I just have no clue what you're saying because I can't read your lips for reference. Next slide, please. Um, that young lady was talking about, uh, she gave a very clear picture of what it's like, how I function um, with auditory processing disorder. Basically, um, with auditory processing disorder, your, your hearing works. It works, but there is a problem in how our brain interprets information. So we get overwhelmed very easily. And I wanna be abundantly clear, it, I do have an invisible disability. And my lived experience is different than a lot of other people would with um, uh, disabilities in general. Um, let me see here. Uh, here are a couple of um, things that really contributed to my success over time. Um, my family, my uh, participating in sports throughout my life, and becoming an expert on how to study. Um, uh, let's see here. I, in becoming an expert on how to study, I knew I had to study in private in a li in a library in a private room away from home and um by studying how to study i became obviously a better student and it made it easier for me to um stay focused um i always kept my my why my why my why t my why was um i always repeated this sentence in my mind I want my nieces to know that they come from very strong women and that we are unbreakable. And that's something that a lot, I mean, you know, we're Latinas. We don't, we're not built to break. <laughs> and so um, let's see here. And next slide, please. So um, this picture represents uh, what my parents, uh, this was the, back of the yearbook for uh, my graduation from high school. And um, my parents really are the ones that made it so that I've stayed successful over time. And they made a lot of right choices of putting me in sports and such to continue to be a scholar and also an athlete. Um, but jumping over to caregivers with, uh, caregivers of those with disabilities. so. And psychologically, the, there is a very well-researched body of literature of the negative impacts of being a caregiver. Um, people who are, they live with stress. They um, have decreased physical and mental health. Um, it's very hard work. Um, I know, as you all know, um, 
an interesting thing that I've discovered in my working with parents of those with disabilities is um, I sometimes ask the parent of somebody I'm evaluating, like with Asperger's or um, with autism, and I ask the caregiver, how are you doing? Because, you know, anxiety is contagious. And so um, most people who are caregivers don't, they don't share how they're feeling to the doctor. And I think that's really important to, to identify and to have the courage to speak out about. Um, part of my work is to strengthen the voices of people who are typically used to not having a voice. Um, I have done a lot of education in being um, with physicians on being more culturally competent, um, being proactive and working with people who um, don't necessarily feel very comfortable conveying symptoms and, and updates uh, on their the person that they're taking care of, their health. Um, you know, uh, many caregivers do require work accommodations, and it takes some level of assertiveness to be able to ask for those at work. Um, um, here, um, there is a concept I did want to bring up in uh, Latino culture, um, particularly focused on women. It's called Marianismo. And Marianismo is the idea that we Latinas are raised to emulate Mary. So to be pious, to be submissive, to be, um, you know, uh, letting the other people, letting the, let their husband traditionally um, run the show when it comes to family. And women uh, sometimes, you know, that it, it, is a, creates a detriment for them in being a caregiver because um, we burn ourselves out. There's a high burnout rate, high depression rate for those who do care, are caregivers. And so I think those are important things to keep in mind. Um, and just like previous uh, speakers mentioned, in, increasing or improving your, your skills of active listening, improving your level of empathy, and the most important one, I think, is knowing your rights as a caregiver, knowing your rights and um, being able to clearly advocate for yourself. If there's a language barrier, I need a translator. And um, I think that's it, guys. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> Dr. Ubalaka, thank you so much for being thank here. You. And thank you so much for that wonderful and, and personal anecdotal story of yours and, and of your perseverance and um, taking the action to know thyself and understand thyself and look for models and, and theoretical frameworks of how to approach um, being your optimal self daily. And girl, you a doctor. So listen, thank you for what you do. Thank you for how you pour into yourself in the community. And thank you for such wonderful and beautiful insight today. That's the first time, team, I've, I've heard of the Marianismo term. Um, and so thank you so much for sharing that and, and that wonderful story. And you're getting a lot of love in the chat box. You, you do have some questions in the chat box, Doc. So if you're able to go in there and um, look at some of those, that'd be, that'd be really helpful. Um, so thank you. Thank you so much. Team, up next, we have uh, a duo coming to the, to, to the mic here. We have Michael. Uh, Rosencrantz, who is from Palm Desert and is the executive director at SoCal Adaptive, and Mr. Will Rogers, who is an athlete and board member of the SoCal Adaptive. Team, take it away, y'all. All right, very good. I'm going to start out. Um, I live in Palm Desert, and I'm actually from north of LA. Um, so I've been on the adaptive sports path for about 12 years. Um, I started on the path uh, when I had the opportunity to live in India and Nepal for seven years and became introduced to wheelchair basketball. And by the way, there's a great article in the June issue of Sports Illustrated about wheelchair basketball. Peter and Aaron Berry play with the University of Alabama. So do check it out. Um, we are three years old. That is SoCal Adaptive Sports. And we formed or we incorporated because there weren't a lot of adaptive sports throughout Riverside County. 
Um, there's some in Southern California, but not a lot. Our thing, my thing is, you know, we're trying through sports, we're trying to create a lot more uh, inclusion throughout society. We want to level the playing field. Um, we teach life lessons through sports and we do, we offer a wide variety of adopted sports. And also we've started doing some music and art. We go to, we, we've gone to a sporting event, um, gone to plays. So the idea is to create a lot of choices uh, for people with disabilities and their families. We do a school program. We're working with the Coachella Valley Unified School District um, in bringing exposure to adaptive sports and creating a lot more awareness uh, about capabilities. And so, you know, we want to see a world where it doesn't matter your ability, but you have choices to do whatever you'd like to do. And so I'm gonna I'm gonna introduce Will. But let me tell you one thing about, or there's a lot of things about Will, which I'll tell you. He's a super athlete. But one of the things that we do in our school program is Will will say a few words. And um, I'll say to Will, hey, students, listen to Will. He's going to tell you what sports he does. And one of the things that he says is he jumps out of airplanes. Now, Will will tell you he has visual impairment. Um, he's also an amputee, and of course, all the children just go, what? And so we're um, exploding contradictions and demystifying disability. Take it away, Mr. Will. Right on. Uh, wonderful to speak with y'all. And yeah, I moved to the Coachella Valley in 1973. Uh, I was 10 years old. Uh, started going to Roosevelt. Anyways, uh, I'm really big. Uh, Eastern Coachella Valley, uh, discover I had uh, no diabetes, so I was 24, and uh, type 1, things started changing real fast. I happened to be lucky enough to work at Eisenhower Medical Center for quite some time, and uh, by the time I ended there, just before I was 40, things took a bad, had my pleasures in Jag, but it's really important to uh, check those blood sugars and the Eastern Coachella Valley is a lot of diabetes and problems that come with it and exercise being an athlete has saved my life. It has brought me to introducing hand cycling one of the first times where I met Mike uh, and uh, we drive out here on uh, Avenue 60 to 66, you know, thermal area, Coachella. And it was tough getting other people to ride with us. So uh, on this venture of inclusion, now going to the schools is awesome. You know, sharing. I love doing archery, uh, water sports, uh, and, you know, uh, fishing, hunting, camping. A lot of those things aren't available to me anymore, but uh, are, they are. Excuse me. I, I mean, uh, hiking and camping, I love. One of the best programs that Southern California Adaptive Sports is we go out with Friends of the Desert Mountains and go up in these uh, canyons around the Coachella Valley. It, it's awesome. You know, it brings back my childhood memories of, you know, and the scouts and so, um, to share that with the children and other people. It, uh, is my thing. I want to include, share the love. And uh, there's a lot of love out there through all these programs and other uh, operations and nonprofits that we had to get the word out. And uh, I know it's getting hot now, but the things are, are still happening. And uh, visit our, our websites and the community boards. And, and I just want to let everybody know and I appreciate you uh, allowing me to share the love. Will and Michael, thank you so much for sharing that. And, and thank you so much for the work that you do at the SoCal Adaptive um, and, and the opportunities that you provide others to participate um, 
in, in, in play and in sports um, and, and in, in just different things um, throughout the, the SoCal area. So thank you so much, team. I, I do see a handful of folks that love to connect with y'all. So if when you have an opportunity, go ahead and look through the – well, team, we – are now in closing of today's session. I'd love um, everyone to please give a virtual round of applause uh, and some love to our wonderful panelists today and our speakers. Um, and a, just a big, big, big thank you to the Hispanic Heritage Foundation and AARP for making this respect a bitly charla possible and the numerous charlas that we've hosted over the years and will continue to host. So thank you, Yvette and AARP for this collaborative work and, and for the space that you've created with us here today. We also wanna say a big thank you to again, all of our speakers who are able to share these personal stories and offer resources. We will be sending an email out later with the Chatla link to rewatch uh, all of our speakers today, as well as all the contact information for the speakers and the valuable resources that our speakers um, shared about today. So team, I just wanna say thank you all for joining. Thank you all for the amazing work that you do. And thank you so much for continuing to hold up our communities, our families and yourselves um, all across the nation. And I just wanna wish you all an absolutely wonderful day and a wonderful rest of your long holiday weekend. And I hope you all get to enjoy it um, and rest up and spend time with loved ones. So thank you all so much. Thank you for being here and have a wonderful afternoon. <laughs>